Hi there, folks. On behalf of PerfectGame.tv, my name is Darren Sutton. In the year 2020, Major League Baseball and baseball as a whole celebrates the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. Not only the Negro Leagues and its great history, but then the impact on Major League Baseball and on sports and on society. We thought it would be very appropriate to gather three PG All-Americans, Ian Muller, Christian Little, and Jordan Lawler, and talk about as young African-American athletes, how they reflect on the Negro Leagues and the impact that they had, certainly going forward in the year 2020. We also brought in Dave Stewart to join the conversation, three-time World Series MVP. I promise you this, I learned a lot. I also wanna let all of you know that Dave Stewart's accounts of being a young African-American player during certain times of his minor league career are very descriptive and may be offensive to some. Let's take you to that conversation. Stu, this is the future of the game right here, at least at three key positions, right? It's up to them to, to take it to the highest level where you went, but they're poised to do it right now. So that's the future. Let's go back to the past and your conversations with athletes, the, the mentors you had. What do you want to share with these young athletes from your mind's eye, what you understand about the Negro Leagues and its history? Oh, I got the first hand. I got it. I got it firsthand from, first of all, Buck O'Neill, who, in my opinion, um, is the Negro League Museum in Kansas City. Um, he was one of the founders of it. Um, Bob Kendrick, who is now the president of the Negro League Museum in Kansas City, um, was sort of a son to Buck O'Neill. And to listen to Buck tell the stories about barnstorming and, and the league and, and the players that played in the league, you know, it's hard to believe when, when he spoke about Josh Gibson and, and the number of home runs that Josh Gibson hit, which Buck says it was about 900 home runs. Um, if you look up Josh Gibson, they'll say that his home runs were between 800 and 1,000 home runs were hit by Josh Gibson. Um, and Josh was, was, a, was a catcher in the Negro Leagues, um, a tremendous hitter. He wasn't a guy that you think would hit you know, 250 two or 260, 270. Josh Gibson was a lifetime 334 hitter in the Negro Leagues and quite frankly, should have gotten an opportunity to play at the major league level. Um, Jackie Robinson was obviously the first player taken. Larry Doby was the second player taken. Larry Doby was the first player that played in the American League. And so Josh Gibson um, was like most players in, in, in the Negro Leagues, played with flair and he played with style, but he played hard. Ian, you, you've been to the museum in Kansas City, and, and so have you, Christian. I'm going to start with you, Ian, and Stu shares his thoughts, the historical thoughts from, you know, Buck O'Neill, who lived it firsthand. What was your takeaway, Ian, from visiting that museum, from what you've read in the history books, and, and, and now it's obviously on the internet, between being there in person and reading what you know about the Negro Leagues, what's your perspective, Ian? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, I went there uh, two summers ago, and I had never heard of Josh Gibson like that. Um, I didn't heard his name before just because he was pretty good, but I didn't know he was uh, that good. And uh, when we got there, um, he was going around the players, and he saved Josh Gibson for the last four reasons. And um, he, was, he was telling us kind of the same things that he just said, like he was the most talented player not to actually play in the league. And uh, and he kind of said the same thing about uh, with Jackie Robinson, too. He said he's definitely more talented than Jackie. He just didn't have the talent level that he did. And uh, to me, that's just insane because, you know, there's people like that that make you wonder, like, how much talent was not shown, uh, you know, in the Negro Leagues that, you know, wasn't showcased in the, in the MLB at the time. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of legends that were lost, you know, that played in the Negro Leagues that didn't get the opportunity, you know. Christian, what was your takeaway from Kansas City in that museum, plus plus what you've read and what you understand about the Negro Leagues and their history? So um, I live about three hours away from the uh, museum, so I've been in the museum a bunch of times since even when I was little. Um, so I've been there a bunch of times. So when I went with Ian, it wasn't my first time going, but it was my first time having somebody explain everything. And just like he said, they saved um, Josh Gibson for last. 
obviously for a reason because he is the best player to ever play in the Negro Leagues. And um, it just – his his situation kind of just shows the inequality at the time. He didn't get to um, showcase himself in the major leagues with all the other best players. Um, my biggest takeaway from, like, the museum and everything was kind of the our privilege that we have today that we have a chance to be able to play in the major leagues and also the that it took a lot to be able to play in the Negro Leagues. And it was a lot of heart, courage, and battling um, to play in the Negro Leagues. Jordan, what has drawn you as you study the Negro Leagues? What, what draws your mind? What draws your you know, imagination? Because you have to recreate what you read about in your mind, like anything in history. Uh, as you recreate some of it in your mind's eye, Jordan, what do you see when you look back at the Negro Leagues? Uh, I kind of want to go off of Christian's idea there because uh, just the tolerance they had to have. I have to constantly think about all the challenges they face on a day-to-day basis, not even or with the other team as well, but just inside their own clubhouse, they were not accepted. And I can't believe trying to go in to play with your team and you got to go in there thinking about, is this guy on my back or how is he going to th- act today or how is how am I going to be perceived? So uh, just – Trying to think about that and imagine how that would feel, it's tough, and I'm happy they were able to be trailblazers and uh, allow us to just go out there and and have fun. Stu, it's so interesting, and this is, again, a simple-minded view, so I apologize, and it's taking history and bringing it forward. Just the courage to play what you love to do, right? These gentlemen, they played the game because they loved it, and they were damn good. I mean, let's be honest. It was twofold. They were really, really good, and they loved it. But again, if those bags had been packed and folks would have gone home and they wouldn't have chased baseball, look, the game wouldn't look the same now that we know it. The, the society wouldn't look the same. I just love what, again, from a simple-minded perspective, what it looks like to be told you can't play with us. That's fine. We'll go play, in some cases, a higher level of baseball on our own to the point where we're growing the game and forcing the hand of the major leagues. I just love the courage combined with the passion, Stu. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, because they were told that they couldn't play. I mean, obviously, that's how their league started. They started a league of their own. And, you know, what was cool about it is so much had been talked about the talent in the Negro Leagues that there was actually players from the major leagues that barnstormed with the Negro League players in the winter months when when the, when the, when the major leagues weren't playing. And so... You had players from the major leagues, white players from the major leagues, playing with the black league, black players, barnstorming cities. And, um, you know, there was talk, and, and I don't know if this is bad information or not, and I don't really know the true story, but there was talk that the Negro Leagues did eventually play the major leagues. And so, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to initially, I mean, when, the, when, when you're knocking at the door, the door is not always going to be open to you. You know, it's interesting. So you have the push in the late 1800s, and then the door closes, and then the Negro Leagues really grow in the 20s. You have Jackie's push in the 40s, and I'm sure there was a lot of discomfort. It's well documented, but yet amazing and great for society in the game. You have Stu the 60s, and again, you were a very, very young man back then, younger than these guys in the late 60s. And then you have now, I mean, where you have athletes that are standing tall, like in my lifetime, I, I'm 50 years old, Stu. I've never seen anything like I'm seeing now, you know, with, with active play and basketball and with baseball and athletes, you know, standing firm for what they believe in. Um, I think it's an interesting time that we're celebrating, and I don't find it ironic because I think there are greater powers at work, that we're celebrating that 100th anniversary at a time where we may experience just as much change, we hope, just as much change as we experienced in 47, 48, 49 in the years that followed. Um, I don't find it ironic at all. As a matter of fact, I think there is a greater hand at work. We're here we are now, Stu, and the walls are being pushed again. There's no doubt about it, but the change exact is exactly what you said. It's, it's in these young men that we're talking to right now. Um, yep. Change is going to happen with you. Um, and change is going to happen with the guy that's standing next to you who may not be your same color, but he is your same age and he's your friend and he helps create change. And that change continues on and on and on and on. And eventually we're in a place, I'm 63 years old. And so what's been encouraging about what's taking place in this country, in this nation, in this world today 
is that this movement has been grasped by your generation. And your generation is the generation that replaces the generation that we're in right now. And that's why there is hope that Major League Baseball at some point, instead of a roster of, of 26 having two or three black players on there, it may be 50-50 at some point. Um, at some point, there may be black ownership in baseball. At some point, there may be 15 black managers instead of two. Um, so change is happening, but we have to recognize, you have to recognize that for there to be change, you have to make the change because you are the next generation. You will be representing going forward. So it's all in your hands and change can only happen if you, if you have a plan. So if you got a plan for change and how to create change and how to make it stick, that gives more validity to what we're trying to do. It's funny, all three of you guys, we, I've asked you this question on the radio show, uh, but I'll ask you again, because I like Stu to listen. And Stu, you jump in anytime you want. To me, this is now becomes a round table discussion. Yes. But, but Christian, what kind of conversations have you had as this summer has grown? It's no longer about the pandemic. I mean, we hope that that someday in the next six months is in the rearview mirror. We hope, we pray, right? For all of us, for our families, for our, for our older, for our grandparents. We really hope that that happens. But the other part of it is the movement, right? And our Black Lives Matter movement in our nation and globally. What kind of conversations have you had in your home with the people that you trust, Christian, uh, as it pertains to you and as it pertains to being an athlete in these times too? Um, so being from St. Louis, we've been dealing with a lot of pre police brutality for years. I think it was in 2014, uh, Mike Brown was shot about 20 minutes away from me by a police, I mean, not police officer, but he was shot. And it was um, big old controversy and protests and everything. And I feel like the discussion has kind of been like, I feel like it's just now getting everywhere else around the country because it's kind of been going on in St. Louis for a while. But as far as the movement, um, just talks in my house about basically using my platform to the best of my ability to uh, create awareness, um, educating ourselves as best as we can. So we're only putting out facts. We're not putting out false information. We're having discussions about everything. Um, using my blackness as not like, like, like a strength for me, basically putting out my blackness and being proud of myself and where my family lineage is coming from. Uh, learning more about my history pretty much is a lot of what we've been doing in my house and trying to have discussions with a lot of my non-black friends and educate them as well. Same question for you, Jordan. Uh, I think it starts with just, we've had, my mom and I have had talks about, it just starts with making or bringing awareness. And then after awareness, it's acceptance. And then you got to take action. So after those three things, that's when I feel change will happen. And I think mainly it's more of a heart problem. You got to change the heart and how people feel about uh, the topic and uh, just the systematic uh, racism and the systematic oppression has been going on for so many years now. It's going to take more than just uh, us black guys. Uh, going to take our other uh, white friends and family to make that change as well because we're just a minority and we need the majority to step up as well. Ian, we've talked about this a lot. Heck, we talked about it at Dream Series. We're talking about, I know you talked about it with Danny, but, you know, the same subject these two guys are talking about. What are your most current thoughts? Uh, yeah, kind of going off what Christian said, uh, kind of the conversations that me and my family have been having is just uh, mainly getting me educated on things and uh, using my platform, uh, you know, to bring awareness. Because I think, um, if anything, people in America listen to their athletes uh, more than, uh, anybody. So um, I think that all three of us have the chance to uh, do something big in baseball and uh, have a really big platform to you. Just getting educated on our history and our, our past and even what's going on now. So when we get to that platform, we get to that stage, uh, we're ready to, to use our voices and, um, you know, use all the resources that we have to bring awareness and to bring change. And uh, those are just, you know, the two main things that in the type of conversations we've been having in my household.
Stu, what advice do you have for these gentlemen? You gave a bunch of it earlier, but, you know, open up the floor again. Now you heard what they had to say. And, again, these are, these are three of the best players in the United States, no matter the color of their skin. These are three, period, of the best players in the United States at their age group. Um, what what, what follow-up advice as you listen to them do you have? Oh, I mean, the, the first thing is always be true to yourself. Um, that, that's the first bit of advice. Be true to yourself. And... And usually when you do that, everything else follows. You got to trust the upbringing, the background, the foundation that you've been raised under and never betray that. Um, when something is wrong, you instinctively know it. You feel it in your gut. And you, you always have to follow your gut. You know, sometimes it's not, it's not what you say. It's how you present it um, that, that's offensive to people. So always give thought to what you're saying and how you're saying it to try to present it in the best possible way for it to be received from someone other than you. I mean, in your mind, you know how you're thinking it, but you also have to, you also have to think about how, how is this going to be received? The biggest problem in, 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 in our country is miscommunication and how we communicate. And so if we can find a, find a place and a space where we just step back and think before we speak, um, I think that a lot of our world issues will, will, will start to be compartmentalized and placed in places that they need to be. Um, but communication, being true to yourself, having self-understanding, self-awareness, and trusting your background and your foundation. So this is very, very casual at this point. Any of you three guys, ask Stu any questions you'd like. And it can be deep stuff that we're talking about now. It can be light stuff. Um, you know, any, any questions you guys take off on a conversation, leave me on the side of the road. I don't really care. Um, you know, Jordan, Ian, Christian, anything you want to ask Stu? Hey, Stu, what was your favorite just moment in your career throughout the MLB? <laughs> My favorite moment? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, shoot, man. I, I guess I had to tell, tell a little bit of my background. I've won three championships. And I've been a league MVP twice and a World Series MVP once. Um, I've thrown a no-hitter in the big leagues. Um, but my favorite moment in Major League Baseball was I received the Roberto Clemente Award in 1990. And the reason why that was my favorite moment is because it meant that even as a baseball athlete, I never forgot that community and, and being involved in my community and being a good human being is much, much more important than playing the game. And playing the game actually gave me a platform to do what I was able to do in my community and across the country. So the Roberto Clemente Award, when I was awarded that, that award, was the best moment in my major league career. Anyone nice, I got a question. Um, was there any times um, uh, during your career, or like what was the worst time that you experienced, um, uh, like, I guess, racism, or when you didn't necessarily feel comfortable uh, playing just because uh, you were uh, – you know, a black person playing baseball. Was there any times that was pretty bad for you? I never felt uncomfortable playing baseball because I was black. I never for one day have been ashamed to be black or ever felt or never let anybody make me feel bad that I was black. Now, I came up in the Dodgers organization. I was drafted in 1975. And our spring training was in a place called Vero Beach, Florida. And Vero Beach, Florida was, in my opinion, one of the worst places that I'd ever been because of the separation. And it wasn't forced segregation, but there was a black side of town called Gifford, and then there was Vero Beach. Um, and so uh, it was an uncomfortable experience, um, in my opinion, being in certain parts of Vero. Um, and so I spent most of my time in Gifford, which was comfortable for me. Um, 
I'm from the West Coast, um, Oakland, California. And the West Coast, I, I feel, has always been different when it came to race relationships than any other part of the country because um, I grew up around Black people and white people and Hispanics and Asians. And so I didn't really understand um, what I experienced in Jackson, Mississippi when I was spent my first year in double A, I went to Jackson and, and was almost run over in a parking lot. And the guy, after he tried to run us over in the parking lot, screamed out that this is no place to eat on the other side of town. And then I got to the big leagues in 1978 and um, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I was standing in the outfield shagging fly balls and there was a parade of white men in the center field stands that were, were chanting from their position, ka, ka, ka. And then wow. Reggie Smith and wow. Dusty Baker and, and Reggie Smith, Dusty Baker and, and, um, and, and, and the guys came out and I asked, I asked them, I said, why were those guys chanting that? And Dusty told me they're calling you a crow, Stu. And I didn't have at that time any idea what a crow was. That was minimal compared to, <coughs> to what Jackie Robinson went through. And I owed it to him to be compliant. And I don't even know if that's the best word, but to be compliant to the things that he went through and his experiences and how many times he wanted to pull the trigger and maybe kill somebody because of the things that he was being called, not being able to eat in restaurants with his teammates, having to stay in a hotel on the other side of town and not stay with your teammates and still call them your teammates. So when I looked at my experiences compared to his, and I'm telling you the honest to God's truth, these are the things that I thought about when people were having what I would call their way with me and I couldn't jump in the stands or shouldn't jump in the stands because that wasn't the way that Jackie would have done it. And he paid the way for me to be able to play the game. So who am I to disrespect his legacy and what he did for me? As we all sit here together, you know, whether we're Caucasian, African-American, or wherever we fall in that spectrum, let's put all that aside. What do we in 2020, all of us collectively around this sport, what do we in 2020 owe the legacy of the Negro Leagues to do going forward? What do we owe those that played Negro League baseball? We celebrate the 100 year, all of us collectively going forward, what do we owe those men? So I think we just continue to bring awareness to the game and uh, try to get the game out to as many kids as we can and keep building up the game as um, keep it to be the America's pastime and uh, stay true to who we are like Stu said, and uh, just keep having fun with it. Stu, what do we owe those men? All of us. I mean, we owe them everything. Everything that we are. If we're going to be major leaguers, we owe them everything. Everything. We wouldn't have this opportunity. We wouldn't be in position to be major leaguers if, if it was not for them and the dues that they paid. You know, when we look at, I look at it, and, and I'll, I'll bring it better to you. Major League salaries are what they are today because of the two strikes that I went through in the lockout, because of Marvin Miller and Donald Fear and those guys advancing the game to today. That's why we can, we can make the type of money that we can in this game. Well, guess what? We couldn't do that if there wasn't a Jackie Robinson, if there wasn't a Josh Gibson, if there wasn't a Larry Doby, if there wasn't a Cool Papa Bell, if there wasn't a Satchel Page. Those guys paved the way, but Jackie Robinson, he was the blueprint for how it's done. And never forget, never forget humility, man. My guess is that you guys are gonna be impact players in the big leagues, but humility, man, is the best asset you have to be remembered past your playing days, to be, remember, be remembered as a human being, to have impact on the game. But I believe this, sure as I'm living, God puts you in a position to do great things. And he did not 
put you on this earth to walk through this lifetime and not be known for nobody to see you. He gave you this opportunity to have impact on others, to touch others. And so Jackie paved it. Humility, strength, it could, because it takes humility and strength for sure. Your, your ability and talent, you wouldn't even be here. But those are the things that, in my opinion, they last long past the game, and people will be saying your name long past the days that you're playing. And one of the, the best things that I experienced, even today, 63 years old and out of the game for over 25 years, I can still go to places and people say, that's Dave Stewart, and they whisper it. And it's not part of it because how I played, but the other part of it is the human being that I am. And Jackie, man, I'm telling you, he had impact on the world, not just baseball. So let's think about who we are globally, not just in the game of baseball. Well, what a real conversation that was. I know I'm better for it. Certainly want to thank those four gentlemen for talking real, talking honest and bringing us uh, and allowing them to walk side by side with them. My father, Don Sutton, went into the Hall of Fame in 1998. One of the great honors for him, right there by his side was Larry Doby. Doby followed Jackie Robinson with the Cleveland Indians in the American League in breaking baseball's color barrier. On behalf of PerfectGame.tv, my name is Darren Sutton.